Star Trek Picard, Season 3, Episode 6, The Bounty. We start out with a meeting of changelings and Vatic giving an insufferable speech about her brothers and sisters suffering, having to wear the faces of the Federation, and how they still need Jack, and how they're going to look for all of Picard's friends. So the Penguin's henchmen are changelings too? I don't know what they are, because she shot one without having any kind of remorse whatsoever. It didn't seem to affect her, so I would say no. Because they're like these clicky things, so what race are they imitating to be? I don't know. I don't know. The, what was that of the uh, repeating meme from Doctor Who? <laughs> yeah, there we go. They looked a lot like him, too. <clears throat> yes, they did. Jack's visions, nightmares, etc. Apparently, he inherited aromatic syndrome from his father. All this time, you know, when Beverly saw him doing this shit when he was a little kid, he had his imaginary friends, and she just thought he was gifted. And when now it turns out he has an overclocked brain. Seriously, she's a doctor. She should have been paying closer attention to her son. She never thought to scan him to make sure everything was okay. I mean, what kind of a doctor is she, let alone mother? I mean, just terrible. Apparently, she has him on drugs now, and so that'll give him decades before it catches up with him, so whatever. Jack is sitting in Hollow 10 Forward. He asks Picard, how did you survive it? And Picard tells him that he didn't. And then they make another reference about his uh, positronic brain and he's and Picard's fully synth body. And that's the part that bothered me. Well, there were many parts that bothered me. But people keep telling us, forget seasons one and two. This is Terry Metalis' Star Trek. It's, it doesn't have ties to that. So they brought this up. They reminded us that he's an android, and then later on in the episode that Molly hasn't gotten to yet, they reinforced that. What would have been nice for Jack to say is to look at this thing that looked like a person, and if Jack would have said, gosh, I wish my father was around so I could ask him some questions. Because it's clear this is not Picard. This is just a robot that's pretending to be Picard. I wish Jack would have said something like that because that would have been delving into topics that I find interesting, that this series used to find interesting, not this series as in this iteration, but back in TNG era. But instead, Jack talks about how Beverly spent all that time trying to shield Jack from Picard's life it's ironic. He was doomed before he was even born. Whatever. And this really felt like a let's shit on Picard episode. It was it was just more apology tour and it was just terrible. Worf and Rafi are now on the Titan. So isn't that just fantastic? And the dialogue coming from Worf was weird. It felt like data dialogue. Picard asked, like, how long has it been? And then Worf gave, like, years, days, and hours or something. Uh, I forget exactly what the unit was. And then there was a line later on where Worf said he was practicing his, what did he call it? Lying or subterfuge or something. And both of those lines would be correct lines for data. I had trouble understanding why Worf was saying them, but it doesn't matter. Please continue, Molly. Yeah, so the music was the... Uh TNG motion picture soundtrack music, and I guess we were supposed to get all emotional over the member berries, but it just seemed like crap. And of course, you know, Rafi and Seven and all that, and just like, ugh. Worf gives a briefing about the whole changeling situation, and of course, Shaw has to speak up with some commentary about the virus that they delivered to the founders back during. Deep Space Nine and the Dominion War, and how, yeah, the cure was delivered, but they created zealots. They drop off at the Daystrom station, Worf, Rafi, and Riker, and they use that key that they got from that Vulcan mobster to get themselves in. Here's where we run into Moriarty, and this wasn't the same Moriarty as we had in The Next Generation. They even stated as much in the episode, this is not the same Moriarty. And it turns out this Moriarty appears to have just been a projection of Data's mind. Because as they go through, they find B4. He's all hooked up, but Soong had died before he was able to complete the integration of the different personalities inside B4. Of B4, Data, Lal, and Lore. They keep talking about how he's human and synthetic, and it was just bizarre. Well, B4, 
I'm making sure I saw the scene correctly. B4 was that head that was on the shelf. This thing that he's sitting in now, it's not B4. It's some other creation that the Sung made. Oh, correct. Yes. Yeah, so this is supposed to be a similar to Picard's positronic synthetic body. So he's almost human. They're both synthetic and human, human at the same time. I don't know how those two things can be, but it doesn't matter. This is Terry Madeline's Star Trek. It doesn't matter. Meanwhile, back at the Starfleet Museum, Jordy's acting like a jackass, and he is basically telling Picard that he's not going to let his daughter go with him, and Picard needs to go do all this stuff on his own and probably shouldn't even be doing this anyway. He should be leaving it to Starfleet. Well, we need to explain how they got there, though. When they were at the Daystrom and they had that away mission, then these other starships came, and I don't know how they found them, like, even at that station, because they were hiding behind a moon. The Titan was hiding behind a moon, kind of like in The Wrath of Khan, but lots of stuff in this series is like The Wrath of Khan. They were questioning, in a very convoluted conversation, about, well, we can't attack these ships because... They have some sort of cargo that's very traceable, and if we do that, we'll be able to be tracked. And then they were talking about, well, how are we being tracked now? Because our, we took out our transponder. And then they introduced this idea that it's not just the transponder on these newer ships. I'm trying hard to interpret what was said. There was a lot of convoluted crap going on the bridge here. It made no sense. But I believe what they were saying was on the br- uh, on these newer ships past Picard's era of knowing what they are. It's not just the transponder, but somehow when they're in proximity to other Federation things, it's like they're on a Wi-Fi network and they communicate constantly their locations and stuff. That's the nearest I can figure out. When the, How they're being tracked, I think, and again, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong because this was all messed up, was whenever they're around any sort of Federation place, Their version of interstellar Wi-Fi connects, and it gives their location, kind of like a cell phone pinging a tower. That's how I interpreted it. That was the only way I think you could interpret it. It was really... They didn't explain it very well. So what they were looking to do was to leave. They left the landing party, the away team, on the Daystrom station, and then they went off to the Fleet Museum where Geordi works because they wanted to see if Geordi could help them. And Jordy won't help them. Okay, fine, whatever. And by helping them, I didn't get this either. They were wanting to duplicate the Titan's transponder, which I thought they said they shut off the transponder, and it was some other technology that was communicating with this interstellar cell phone pinging. But they were going to clone the transponder of the Titan, and I guess put it on another ship, as a decoy for people to follow? Oh, they were going to put it all over the place from what I could tell. But how's that going to help? It seemed... They, they shut the transponder off, so this cell phone pinging was something else. Well, it seemed like Shaw and everybody else on the Titan, they seemed to be unaware of this weird networking issue, but Jordy seemed to know all about it. It was, it was again, it was convoluted and made no sense. Jordy wants Picard and company to leave, but Picard is supposed to leave Geordi's daughter there, and Picard is supposed to say she was an unwilling participant in, I guess, their mutiny. I don't even know. They're stealing the starship. Whatever. Geordi's other daughter apparently works there at the museum, which, okie dokie, whatever. And this daughter, the new daughter, that's the real-life daughter of LeVar Burton. Yeah. Whereas Sidney LaForge is just an actress playing another one of his daughters. Yeah. At the Daystrom Station, we see all sorts of really messed up things, like this creepiest Tribble ever. The Daystrom Station, just to present this to the audience, what this is, it's not really the Daystrom Institute. This is the Daystrom Station. The first thing I was thinking was Phoebe Station, if anybody knows the expanse and the mystery of Phoebe Station in Season 1. But this Daystrom Station is Area 51, essentially, for Starfleet. That's what this is. Yeah, yeah. Apparently unmanned, by the way, (laughs) which makes me wonder, is this also a museum because nobody else seems to be working there? And it appeared like perhaps they might have James T. Kirk's body there. Yeah, there was this display that's on the wall that said James T. Kirk, 
and you saw like a an outline of a body, and it sounded like the old school med lab heartbeat, you know, doot, doot, doot. Are they keeping him alive? Is that what we're supposed to? I, I don't know. I, I didn't know what that meant, other than seeing James T. Kirk and seeing an outline of a human form. Yeah. So if anybody caught what that actually was, please let us know in the comments. At the, the museum. There was also a killer tribble that they modified. Yeah, the creepiest tribble ever. That, you know, that it was behind a glass door, but they had to show that because they needed that member, Barry. Meanwhile, back at the Fleet Museum, because Geordi's being such a jackass... Sydney and Jack take matters into their own hands, and they've decided that they are going to steal the cloak from the bird of prey that's there, the bounty, which apparently was collected from the bottom of San Francisco Bay. That's another thing. When they showed up to this museum, they had all these different starships. Seven and Jack were on the bridge when LaForge was talking to Picard in, in some other room. And it was like they were flipping TV stations. First they started with the Defiant, and then you heard the Defiant musical notes. Then they went to a few other ships, including Voyager. It was member berries. They were, they were sitting in their living room, flipping around on the television set, their view screen, and watching old Star Trek, better Star Trek ships and music. And I just shook my head and said, member berries. Yeah, and there was a bizarre conversation between Seven and Jack about how Seven was reborn on Voyager and that the crew there was her family and how she is now trying to find another family. So we've got more found family there. And I'm really getting sick of that trope, like, big time. They they choose this opportunity to rip on Picard some like with the with Jack and his poetic drive-by observations. How Picard was equal parts annoying and endearing, just like Jack. Whatever. And LaForge was weird. In one moment, he was getting all over Picard's ass about stuff. And then the next minute, he was kind of just going on with Picard about getting old and having a family and that. And it was like you snap a finger and he was going off. Okay, which LaForge will be getting this sentence? Yeah, because then Jordy was talking to Picard about Sydney and how she's stubborn just like he is. And then they're talking about passing on flaws and Picard says something along the lines of the sins of our past. And it's like, what is he even talking about? How How is the sins of our past seriously... This is optimistic Jean-Luc Picard. This is what people on the net are claiming is brilliant television. Apparently, Jean-Luc Picard, all he did since The Next Generation, and probably during The Next Generation, based on Jordy's little snide comments he makes every once in a while, is Picard just started crap. He got people ticked off at him. He endangered people's lives endlessly. Picard was just a horrible person. That's how... This series, Jordy, and previous conversations we've had, that's just how Picard is now. That is Jean-Luc Picard. What you saw on TNG is apparently not what he was. He endangered people recklessly left and right. He was a horrible person. He would have nothing to pass down to any sort of offspring except his sins. He's a piece of garbage. Jean-Luc Picard in this series is a piece of garbage. Jordy and Picard come to an understanding that Picard is going to leave. Jordy's not going to help him, and Picard is going to leave Sydney there with Jordy. When Sydney finds out about this, she yells at her father because, well, she has no agency of her own, Sydney. And she tells him that this crew from the Titan is her family, and she learned that from Jordy himself. Again, just weird messaging in this particular episode. There was even some weird conversation there. We now know why Sydney was called Crash at Starfleet Academy. She told her father she used to crash things so that she and her father could fix them together. And then a little bit before she said that, she mentioned that she wasn't her sister because her sister went into engineering in her father's footsteps and something like, you'd be disappointed in me or something. And I'm scratching my head going, did they just not watch season one of Star Trek The Next Generation? I could have swore, and somebody correct me, Jordy was either sitting 
at Helm or Navigation. I forget which swan. So wouldn't Sidney LaForge be following in her father's footsteps on his original career path, which was being on one of those stations? That conversation made no sense. Yes, in season two, he moved down to engineering, but season one, he was either at the helm or at navigation. I don't remember which one. So his daughter absolutely would be following in his father's footsteps. Sydney would be. Shauna loves Jordy. He was geeking out. They used a number of terms in this episode, as in they actually said geek out. Jack called Picard his old man, too. Worf said something about table scraps. It was really weird. I found the dialogue to be way too time period based, as in now, versus a more intellectual form of communication. It was too informal and informal reflecting our values and speech patterns today, as opposed to what you would expect from people in the future. This is the same group that doesn't understand that it was difficult for Captain Kirk to come to Earth and uh, of our time and figure out swearing. And he would end up saying things like double dumbass on you because they didn't curse in the future. I was going to say it's slang. My old man. Why would you call your father your old man? I was expecting Picard later to say, yeah, yeah, when, when Beverly and I were together, she was my old lady. Just using this weird slang that even now is kind of passe. Mm hmm it, just weird. A very weird use of slang language. Current slang, or I would even argue it's close to archaic now in 2023, and they're putting it in, in something that's supposed to be set hundreds of years in the future. Yeah, so Shaw and his love fest for Jordy got interrupted because of the whole cloak thing. And at first, Jordy blames Picard for this, but then they quickly realized that it was Jack and Sydney on their own who went and stole the cloak. Unbeknownst to them, they tripped an alarm because they stole this cloak. And Jordy goes off on Picard about how many rules he's violated, and Picard says something like, well, you'll just have to add it to my tab. And of course, the cloak is overheating, and Sydney can't fix it. So Jordy has to come in and fix it himself, but he can't resist saying to Jack, stay away from my daughter. Yeah. Meanwhile, the crew that is on, that is on Daystrom Station, they're out of time. And somehow the comm badges work now between Daystrom Station and, well, the museum where everybody else is. That made no sense to me, but I guess this whole thing started with a comm badge going across Great distance using subspace or whatever. I don't understand how communicators work in this Terry Madelis Star Trek. In the very first episode, Dr. Crusher sent a message to Picard's communicator over a great distance. And I was like, how does that even work? As I remember how these communicators used to work is there was a certain range to these things. And after that range, they wouldn't work anymore. Like if a ship left orbit, you couldn't talk to your ship anymore. So... When that happened in episode one, some people online were saying, well, since then, they set up all these subspace relay things, kind of like cell towers. Okay, let's just go with that. And then in this episode, when the landing party, the uh, away mission, was stuck on Daystrom Station, and then the Titan had to leave, the away team couldn't communicate with the Titan anymore. Okay, now it's working like it always has. If you get out of range, your communicators don't work. But then, when they were getting ready to leave the museum with the cloaking device, they communicated back with the away party. And they, were, they said, we're on our way, meaning they weren't around there yet. So somehow the communicators work across great distances again. So which is it? Is it there's a limited range to these items, which is how it always has worked up until this series, this season in particular, or are there subspace relays all over like cell towers? I don't understand how the communicators work. When one's dealing with science fiction, in order to suspend disbelief, what you need to do is set up the rules of the universe, and you need to stay consistent with those rules in-universe. That's how we're able to suspend disbelief. If you push this button and it always makes this noise, it's not important to me what that button, what the technology behind it actually is, as long as it does the same thing every single time. But the communicators in this... They work however the 
script writer decides they're going to work. Even within the same episode. Yeah. Jordy and Sydney have a moment where Jordy confesses that he's actually disappointed in himself for not making the same decisions his younger self would have made. I guess this is his way of acknowledging he was being a jackass in this episode. I guess. This whole thing was horrible. Unfortunately, I, I guess everybody's a jackass. Yeah. Every all your TNG people are jackasses. So if you like TNG, they're all jackasses. Just be aware of that. The away team doesn't get out in time. Riker gets captured and he's getting beaten on by who knows what the hell that thing was supposed to be. It, it looked like a very fleshy, peachy colored uh Klingon from Discovery. It was, I don't even know what that was supposed to be. It was so dark, you couldn't even see. I thought it was like a Saru, a Kelpian or a Kelpin, whatever he is. No, it wasn't a Kelpian. That's I what know. I thought he was. Well, it was so dark, I couldn't tell. Yeah, I couldn't tell either. It but, didn't matter anyway. Yeah, so this thing has its phaser right up to Riker's head, and it looked like they were about to shoot him. But then they shot the other two security officers, I guess they were, uh, instead and the next thing we know, uh, it's it's Vatic laughing, I guess, again, because that's all she does. Riker's transferred to the Shrike, and lo and behold, guess what? Deanna's been captured, too. Or at least that's what we're led to believe. It might just be a changeling looking like her. Who knows? They need Data to tell them what was stolen from the Daystrom station. After going through several other personalities, <laughs> Data tells them that it was the human remains of Jean-Luc Picard. So Picard's corpse had been kept on Daystrom Station, and that is what was stolen. How did he tell them that? His eyes turned into a projector, and he projected a picture of Picard's body, I think on the wall, but maybe it was just floating in air. This is right after, I mean, almost immediately after, they had this discussion that Jordy said something like, he's synthetic, yet he's human. Now, by the way, I would find that conversation interesting, what is human? But to me, human is organic. So you've got synthetic and you've got organic. You cannot be both. If you are both, that's at least an episode of Star Trek. Let's talk about it. He just <laughs> asserts it. like, And then he's got these projector eyes. Really? That's human. Yep, that's human. You're right. No. <laughs> it reminded me of in the first Star Wars movie, A New Hope, when R2-D2 was projecting that Princess Leia projection of, help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. That's what it looked like, the light coming out of Data B4's eyes. It looked so... I laughed so hard. It was, I mean, this episode, like the last... 15 minutes. I laughed so hard. It was a fun watch just to see how bad it got. Yeah, this episode, there were so many things wrong with this episode. A lot of it was so ridiculous. We're not even going to be able to enumerate all the bizarre wrong things that happened in this episode. So this is just an overview of some of the more major problems I guess the more egregious, because this was so bad. It got to the point where it was like watching an asylum version of Star Trek. Or back in the day before that, remember, was it Mad or Cracked used to do magazine? They used to do those parodies of different franchises. It's like Cracked or Mad did a parody of Star Trek. Or, or a robot chicken version. Or a robot chicken. For people chicken. who are more familiar with that. Or... It was like the story you would get in a porno, but without the sex, because you wouldn't want to see these old fuddy-duddies getting it on. That's what the story is like. They have the techno babble, which makes no sense. They have continuity issues with things not even flowing in the same episode, like, like the, the com badges. Mm -hmm. And it's so ridiculous over the top with now they've stolen... Picard's body, which apparently was so much more dangerous than the portal weapon that they took. Uh, I mean, they're body snatchers now. There's probably going to be little board pieces in there, but why you wouldn't take seven to get those, I have no idea, because you think that she would have... Or she... anybody else. Echab, where's his body? Well, you know, they drilled his eyeball out. and yeah. Or any of those Borg that they had in season one. Who would have had far more Borg technology in their bodies than Picard's dead body would. 
I was laughing so hard. And I mean gut coming from the gut laughing as silliness. When Seven was on the bridge with Jack and they were flipping the view screen stations and going to different ships and they would play a few notes of the theme song from that series, I laughed so hard. I know this was supposed to be touching. And I will admit, the last ship they touched on before the Klingon ship was the Voyager ship. Seven was reminiscing for a quick two seconds with the music playing. It felt like that might have been Seven. Maybe it was just because the music was playing. Mm -hmm. But that was it. Like, the rest of it was just so ridiculously over the top. I was laughing. They're yelling member berries at you as she was flipping the channel. I laughed so hard during that scene. That part actually made me angry as well as the footage from TNG of Riker. Oh, we didn't even mention that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should mention that now. When Riker first met Data, and Data was whistling Pop Goes the Weasel. So they're facing down Moriarty, who's shooting at them with live ammunition on a space station, no less. They know he's a hologram, but Rafi shoots a phaser at him and is surprised it doesn't do anything. Ugh, yeah. So they keep hearing these musical notes, and of course, Riker, being a musician, can identify them. And he finally figures out that it's Pop Goes the Weasel from that very first time that he met Data. So he whistles it back, and that makes Moriarty disappear. It's member berries. When we finally figured out, when Riker figured out what this was, and they started showing that TNG footage... Oh my, I mean, you got angry. I started laughing uncontrollably. It was so, to me, it was so hilarious. It's like, now you're not satisfied with just having musical cues to force people into thinking this is Star Trek. You actually Trek. have to use the footage. Yeah. Uh, it, that coupled with the starships from better shows. That's what it reminded me of. Jeez, I wish I was watching that show or that show. That's why I got so angry because... Turn it back, Seven. I want to watch that show. Yeah, exactly. Can we watch Voyager instead, please? Because that was so much better than this. That's why I got angry because they should not have referenced those better times with the ships and the music because it just really hit home how crappy Picard really is. The series and this person... And this person, I'm convinced, this character is an android. I'm convinced they keep bringing it up. This is not Picard. Picard died fighting those flowers in season one. Jack never got to meet his father. Well, it makes me question, when they get that body back, it, are they going to revive Picard? They're going to put his whatever the hell is inside this robot back inside that body. Well, it shouldn't work like I, that. It, this is Terry Maddell of Star Trek. It's oh. going to work like this. God. And it's funny because now whatever this data thing is, it has data, lore, lol, he's doing what you see on TikTok where these kids, they all think they have DID. Well, they're pretending they have DID. Correct. And so they do these weird shifts in their facial expressions and then move to a different personality. That's what data was doing. Yeah, they pretend that they have disassociative identity disorder, more commonly known as multiple personality disorder. And these kids, they go on TikTok and they make these videos of themselves shifting between personalities. And that's what we saw with the Data character in this episode. Terry Manalis thought to appeal to young kids, Gen Zers, that he was going to make this guy have DID, this entity, whatever Data is now, and that was going to be how he's going to appeal to Gen Z. Well done, Terry. Well done. Overall, I didn't like this episode. There were parts I was laughing at toward the end, but for the most part, the member berries just made me angry. The nonsense, even more so. I, I, just, I don't understand how anybody can like this. Most of it does not make sense. It's incoherent. They're ripping off pieces of better shows and putting them together in a way that is absolutely absurd, if not offensive. You and I talked about this a little bit ago. The ink blot tests. What are those called? Uh, Rorschach tests. So when you look at those shapes, the goal is to take something, project whatever you're thinking onto those shapes. You identify what you see in those shapes. They don't really have any sort of form by themselves. I think that's what this series is. The people who are saying that they're loving it, it's because they're bringing in their own projections into this. They're seeing these ink blobs 
on the screen that kind of look like Riker, kind of look like Picard, and they're adding all this extra stuff to it. And I think that's why we're seeing people say, oh my God, this is fantastic. And when one tries to sit down and say, but look what they're doing. Look at the ridiculous lines coming out of their mouths. Look at all this. And they're like, well, sure, it's not perfect, but it's really good. But it's not really good. Yeah, but it's better than the first two seasons. Yeah, but it's not. It really isn't any better than the first two seasons. What I would challenge those people, because they're not going to understand what I'm saying, is you're caught up in feelings right now of what you're bringing into this. You reacted a certain way by hearing the music, those musical cues, or seeing those old actors playing their old characters or getting them all back together. What I'm suggesting, and you can't do this right now, wait six months. Try re-watching the whole series again. In fact, try in between now and six months, watch TNG again. Then try to watch a season. Tell me how well it flows together. Because it's not going to. You're going to notice a distinct quality drop-off between TNG and this. And I think you're bringing your own stuff into this. People have accused us of being haters. We're trying really hard not to hate on this because I actually didn't hate this episode. Molly reacted very negatively. I laughed so hard that I'm actually going to say I enjoyed this episode, but it was for the wrong reasons. I'm starting to think every even-numbered episode they're doing in a funny shtick way because I've enjoyed episode 2, episode 4, and episode 6, all for the same reason. And, of course, the joke being that in the TOS motion pictures, everybody kept saying, which I don't agree with, that the even-numbered Star Trek movies were the good ones. Now, I'm liking the even-numbered episodes in this season, but I'm liking it because I'm making fun of it. It is so ridiculous. I'm just sitting there. It's a comedy. I'm laughing so hard. And I would just challenge the people who are so quick to say we're haters how do you know there's not something going on with you? We're haters, but you know you're fine. Why? Because you go to Rotten Tomatoes and you see some number that you think represents something. Just take six months. I know it's not going to help right at this time, but I've been through enough things to know how this works. Wait six months. Come back and watch this. You're going to start saying, oh my gosh, that Molly and the Old Man channel that I hated on in the comments... They actually had a point. They saw some positives here, but a lot of ridiculous, cobbled-together crap. That's what this is. The music, the props, the actors, they're all manipulating you on purpose to blind you for what's actually going on here, which is crap. I don't know how to get across to people who are calling us haters. You can't, so you really shouldn't bother. I guess so. I don't want to hate this. I've been looking for positives. As I said, in this episode, there was a few seconds when the Voyager theme was playing and we were seeing Voyager on the screen, the actual ship, and Seven was talking. That for just that brief moment, it felt like Seven of Nine. Every episode, I do try to find something positive. I would like to talk about more positives. When Jack and Picard were talking, guess where Jack was? He wasn't in a place that meant something to him. He was in the holodeck, and guess what the holodeck was giving a simulation of? Ten forward! LA ten forward. So this stuff, which goes right back to last week when I said Molly and I are convinced they, they made this set, and they're going to wedge this set in any chance they can. This show is nonsensical. Had Jack at that time as I suggested earlier in this review, said to that person he was talking to, that robot, when that Picard robot said, I didn't beat it, I'm, I'm a robot now. That's essentially what Picard said in this episode. Jack's response should have been, wow, I really wish I would have gotten to know my father. And then Picard could have looked down and we could have maybe had the beginning of a conversation of what is life? What is artificial life? There are so many conversations to be had. I've said this before. They throw this dime store philosophy at you, and then they never touch on it again. Because even the thing that's going on with Data, that's the one that makes the most sense since he was never organic to begin with. 
But they're just, so far, they're just, nah, they're, just, they're playing it almost for laughs. It's going to be, we're going to have all these different personalities talking at different times. And I imagine that's how the rest of the season is going to go. Because when Lore's personality spoke up, both you and I were laughing. Because he had like an evil grin on his face and he was looking. <laughs> it's like, really? This is just like those TikTok videos. That doesn't mean, do I believe people have DID? Absolutely. It's a real disorder. But on TikTok, everybody, every third person thinks they have it. And now they're doing it in this. At that point, I just raised my arms up in the air and said, this is Terry Madalas' Star Trek. We are 60%, 6 out of 10 episodes, into this. So I don't think this is going to get to a point where I'm going to call this even remotely good. Terry Madalas should not be given another season of this or another series. They're talking about this Dominion War. If you're a Deep Space Nine fan, do you really want Terry Madalas digging his claws into that? That lore, Deep Space Nine, up until this season, has mostly been safe. Do you really want him digging into that? Really? Terry Madalas has shown me he is a hack just like the hacks that came before him. He is Alex Kurtzman with a different face. Maybe he's a changeling and it's Alex Kurtzman behind the scenes. I hope Terry Madalas is done with Star Trek after this season. We are 60% in. This is not going to get better. It's just not. Molly and I were talking. We don't know if this is for sure. But when Jordy mentioned about that Wi-Fi or whatever that he called it, how ships communicate with each other and that's how you're going to be able to figure out somebody's location that somehow is different than the transponder. And if you remember from our last week review, when we suggested they were going to steal from the new Battlestar Galactica. Oh my gosh, all these new ships have this technology. I guess you can't rip out of it. But hey, the old ships don't have networking. They're before networking, this type of network. So I hope that I'm way wrong and I'm just thinking worst case here. But I hope they don't haul their ass to that museum and jumpstart one or several of those ships and rip off Battlestar Galactica. Because I joked about it last week. Now I'm starting to get pissed off if they actually do it. <laughs> this show is such a joke. It is a joke. I do not understand people who are getting moved by the music or the characters. I, I get it. I get it. I, I, living in the past in good times is a good thing. But I want to move forward with Star Trek. Do new things. Just don't crap on the past. Terry Madalas is crapping on the past. It's been said that Terry Madalas is this huge Star Trek fan. Which Star Trek? Not what he worked on. Which Star Trek is he a fan of? I'm guessing Deep Space Nine because I think Terry Madalas hates the next generation. Because what I'm seeing on screen shows a latent hatred toward the source material. I don't know Terry Madalas. I'm looking at his work and I don't like it. I don't see this as any different than what came before in the previous two seasons. This guy's a hack, just like Alice Kurtzman, and I do not want this guy continuing with this franchise after episode 10. And if you don't agree with that, I don't know what to tell you. We are definitely on different sides of the street here because this is not cutting-edge science fiction. This is not. Go back and watch The Expanse. 2015, I think, was the first season of that. Go watch that! 2015! Tell me that's not better than this. By a bunch. In 2023, this is the best cutting edge science fiction. It's not perfect. You know what? It's not only not perfect, it's not good either. Sorry, Molly. I just, I'm getting so sick. I don't mind people having differing opinions. But when people start calling us haters, they don't know who we are, where we came from, how many decades like they are. We watched Star Trek through the decades. I have a personal story, just like all of you, on how I watched Star Trek when I was a little kid. First run. So do not dump your shit on our wall and tell us that we're just a bunch of haters. This upsets me that this is what Star Trek is now, and I want Terry Madalas out of here. I want Secret Hideout out of here. If that means 10 years this franchise goes to sleep, I don't know if I'm going to live that long, but if I am sitting in some really old nursing home, at least when I stick on Star Trek, it'll actually warm me inside instead of this crap. Well, that was laughing at it to very angry in a very short amount of time. Yeah, I guess I was laughing 
during the episode to cover up a hell of a lot of pain. Yeah. Well, what else can you do? Because that was, it was really bad. They're actually desecrating corpses now. They are taking corpses and animating them and disrespecting the dead. So they are grave robbing, which, uh, yeah, that's something that I've said all along is that the way they strip mine these old franchises, yeah, it's grave robbing. That's what they're doing. They're trying to steal any kind of wealth from that body, that corpse that was in the ground. And that's what this is. So I'm not surprised that they finally are just going to flat out steal corpses on the show. So. (laughs) I would recommend this only if you want to laugh. But actually, now that Molly mentioned it, if you care about Star Trek, don't don't watch don't watch this. Because the laughing is laughing at, I didn't realize people could go this low to do something. It's a dark humor laugh. This is just sad. If you care about Star Trek, because most people I know who are real Star Trek people, they have stories like I have, where they grew up and they bonded with Star Trek in some fashion. Maybe they had a tragedy that happened and Star Trek gave them some stability in life. You go to Star Trek conventions, at least the older conventions, pre-Discovery, and you could bond with people just on their stories. How did you find Star Trek? And those stories resonated. And it usually had to do with some sort of tragedy or something that happened that Star Trek gave them some sort of structure in their life. I could go to Star Trek conventions and talk to people, and I would usually bond with them in some way. I think that's because once upon a time, the people who worked on Star Trek, the writers, the actors, anybody who was involved with the show, they could identify with those people. They were those people. However... The people who write this stuff now, who work on the show, they are not like us. And we are not like them. They are privileged people living the Hollywood lifestyle who, for them, this is a job. People talk about what a great fan of Star Trek Terry Metalis is. Well, just because you worked on a show, it doesn't mean you were a fan of that. I'm just going to use Kathleen Kennedy for example. The way that she has treated Star Wars and Indiana Jones, I question whether or not she ever actually cared for those franchises or if she actively hated them. Again, for these people, a job is a job. They get paid. They don't watch the product after it's completed. They aren't fans of this stuff. That's oftentimes what happens when it's not the original creators working on these things. Patrick Stewart's not even a fan of Star Trek. No. He He said as such. He never got science fiction. Yeah. Even Patrick Stewart's not a fan of Star Trek. No. And it bothers me how many people get confused that these creators, they were different from the showrunners now. Actors were never the character that they loved on screen. The actor portraying that character is very different from the character that they're portraying. I mean, you just think about Alan Rickman. He played Snape, and he played the Metatron in Dogma. He also played a terrorist in Die Hard. But he was none of those people. He was just the actor portraying very different characters. I think people still get confused that Patrick Stewart is not Jean-Luc Picard. But when they see him, they automatically think Jean-Luc Picard, and they ascribe to him all the qualities that they thought that Picard had. And it couldn't be further from the truth. I hope he's not what Picard is, because Picard now is a piece of garbage who put people in danger, and he has to go on these large apology tours because he kept screwing up his entire life. So I hope Patrick Stewart's not that, because that's a horrible piece of crap person. I mean, there's so much to talk about as far as people liking this versus those of us who don't, versus people who don't seem to comprehend the qualitative differences between Star Trek The Next Generation and this Picard show, and they don't seem to quite comprehend that there's a lot more to it than just lighting and whether or not it's episodic, or if there's a story arc for the season. Or, you know, the films uh, versus, again, 
an episodic television show. And you try to have these conversations with some people and they get very angry with you. And I think that's mostly because they don't understand what you're talking about. They are very over emotional about the whole thing. And it's impossible to have an intellectual conversation about it. How can you have a conversation with somebody who thinks art is objectively looked at? How do you do that? How do you have a conversation with somebody you can't. who doesn't know the difference between objective and subjective? You can't. Or literal and figurative? You cannot. If you can't agree on language, how can you have a conversation with people? How many times in our comments have people said, this season is objectively better? <laughs> There's no way to prove that. Art is not objective. You don't have a ruler. Objective means you have a ruler you can hold it to. If I say this pencil weighs one pound, and you say it weighs 10 pounds. It's a big pencil, first of all. <laughs> but you have to stick it on a scale where we agree on what a pound is for it to give me an objective number to say, based on what pounds are, this is how heavy this pencil is. But when I say this pencil is beautiful, there's no way. Going back to Star Trek lore, when Spock was asked in Star Trek IV, when he was getting re-educated, and he was being asked all these science questions, and he came up with objective answers, scientific answers to problems. And the last question he got stumped on is, how do you feel? And then Spock was like, I don't understand how to answer that question. That's because it's subjective. It took the end of that movie for him to understand, how do I feel? I feel fine. That's subjective. We're talking to people in the comments who think objective and subjective are the same thing, who think literal and figurative are the same thing. How can you have a conversation with these people when you can't agree on what words mean? Art is subjective. You cannot say this season is objectively better. That is nonsensical talk. You can't objectively prove any art is good or worse than some other piece of art. You can't. It's subjective. Art is subjective. There's no ruler you can stick up to it. And why am I having to explain to people who are probably, old, they're at least probably in their 30s in some cases, and they don't understand the difference between objective and subjective? Oh, I think there are people older than that who don't know the difference. But I think that's why... Our comments appear to be in a higher quality than a lot of the comments that I see on other channels. Our regulars are awesome. Yes. They have a high language skill and they're able to talk about abstract. You guys should feel really good about yourselves because we have a ton of respect for you and I hope you have respect for us because you engage in thoughtful, interesting conversation. Yep. Yeah. So at least we're getting that out of these horrible shows. We have been able to form a community of other people who seem to operate on a different plane from the average viewer, and I'm very grateful for that. It's not even an intelligence thing, because some people would boil it down to, oh, what are you saying? The people who disagree with you are stupid? I don't think they are stupid. Some of them may have very high IQs. I just question, what is subjective versus objective? There's something wrong that if you don't know the difference... It's almost like something was bred out of them to understand what art is. Art is the eye of the beholder stuff. It's not something you can put a ruler up to. Well, when you are taught nothing but multiple choice exams and there is one correct answer, there is no room for abstract thought or opinion. Yes, essay versus multiple choice questions. That's what we're dealing with here. But we have so many good subscribers on here that I learn every single post, every time we post a video, we have our regulars, as we call them, and they always share something interesting or something worthwhile. We have one of our commenters who likes to take what happened in the episode and either rewrite it in a way that makes sense or rewrite it in a way that's just so ridiculous yet would fit in with what they're doing on this series. I, I call it snark, and I love it. And that takes so much ability and imagination to do that. Yeah. We learn every time we read that. We learn when people share their accounts of what they thought of the episode or what didn't work, what their favorite Star Trek is uh, series is. We learn so much. That's why we started this channel, or Molly started it. I just jumped on. Because we learn about things. And we don't like some things, and we are very vocal about sharing that. Molly's Doctor Who video is what started this whole channel off, and that set the tone for the rest of the channel. Anyway... 
Overall, we didn't like this episode. If you've got a really strong stomach, there was stuff to laugh at. However, if you don't like seeing corpses of the characters you used to love being desecrated, I would recommend not watching this. Leave your comments below. Take care.